Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to the CNCF uh, TOC Cloud Native Experts panel. Um, I'm sure we have more people filter in as the lunch ends, but um, because of time, I just want to make sure we were able to get started and get into the um, to the sessions and to the questions. And uh, be thinking of a question because I'm going to come to the audience about halfway through. And if you have a good question, you might win something. So think of a good question, except for you. No questions from you, but anyone else can ask a question. Um, so I want to kind of start off just introducing the panel. Uh, so I'll, I'll start off with Chris, and uh, Chris, just give uh, everyone an introduction to, to who you are. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Chris Anisik. Uh, I'm serving as CEO of the Cloud Native uh, Computing Foundation, uh, which lives under the Linux Foundation. I'm also executive director of the uh, Open Container Initiative, which is trying to standardize containers. So I've been uh, involved with kind of the uh, beginning and formation of the foundation. Um, so basically who I am. Jonathan. And we'll go to um, Jonathan next from CoreOS. Nope. Yep, you're on. It's on. It says on. Hello? Yep. Oh, that works. Uh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I feel like I should introduce you now, but uh, no, I'm Luke Marston. Uh, I am the head of developer experience at Weaveworks. Um, and at Weaveworks, we are building tools to help uh, DevOps teams iterate faster on microservices um, by doing continuous delivery and observability. Uh, and my name is Ben Sigelman. I'm a founder and CEO at Lightstep, which is a uh, a company that does root cause analysis and APM for microservices, and I'm also the uh, co-author of the Open Tracing Standard, which uh, attempts to uh, um, create a, a consistent way of describing the behavior of microservice applications in the cloud-native environment. Thanks, Ben. So what I want to do is sort of start off with um, kind of asking a, a general question to, to everyone. Well, I have Chris start off with the answer. Uh, but <laughs> What is cloud native? What's the definition of cloud native? Uh, you know, there's a couple ways of defining it, but if I kind of do the strict definition from uh, the actual cloud native computing foundation charter, uh, essentially um, it's a form of, uh, you know, cloud native technology has three properties to it. Essentially, uh, it has to be container packaged uh, and uh, essentially uh, microservices oriented and uh, dynamically scheduled in some, uh, some, some fashion. So essentially you have dynamically scheduled microservices living packaged in containers, essentially. That's really um, you know, how we kind of look at it from uh, our perspective. But uh, you know, if you kind of step back uh, and, and kind of look at it, you know, if, if you kind of look at some large scale companies out there like Google, Facebook, and Twitter, you know, these folks have been kind of running in a cloud native fashion for, uh, for a very long time, right? You know, they've been taking advantage of container technology before you know, Docker came around and, and so on. So they've been running this way because there's a lot of you know, benefits to uh, you know, running in a cloud native way. There's a lot of efficiency gains and, and so on that happen um, when, you run, when you run it this way. But I'm sure other folks have their own thoughts of what kind of cloud native uh, uh, means. So if anyone wants to, feel free to try and then. I think that uh, summarized it. Are we working a bit better this time? Microphone? Yep. No? Right. Uh -oh. I think that summarizes yeah, it pretty yeah. well. Um, it's really about you know contrasting with the old world of running one application per server or something like that, moving to just to a much more dynamic system where you think about start to think about running multiple applications uh, you know simultaneously in a cluster and be able to move them around very easily um, to get a lot, all the kind of benefits you get from that. So definitely sort of decomposing these old giant applications and thinking about things, packaging things in a more uh, you know smaller and sort of more dynamic world. Yeah, so I completely agree with, with those definitions. And for what it's worth, my, my take on cloud native is that um, th there's really both a social aspect to it and a technical aspect to it. I, I think the social aspect to cloud native is about um, uh, breaking an application down into, or, or, or compartmentalizing a company into different small teams where each team can focus on doing one thing really well and be responsible for one microservice and be responsible for delivering that microservice, update it whenever they like, and like you say, be sufficiently decoupled that they can work independently of other teams and, and not have to release things at the same time. And then from a technology perspective, I mean, the, the, the CNCF and the cloud, te cloud native technologies like uh, Kubernetes, Prometheus, um, the, the technologies that 
uh, that we're developing at Weaveworks uh, are, are all about sort of enabling um, deployment of those applications and management of them and, and, and observability at runtime and, and all these important things that you need to, to have in order to actually operate them sanely. Yeah, I mean, I, I won't summarize exactly what you all have said, but I will say something a little bit different, maybe a tiny bit more provocative, that um, cloud native is the, uh, is, isn't really what we wanted. I think what we really wanted was to be able to write applications that fit in a single process and have that just scale. It turns out that's impossible, which is yeah. the problem. So cloud native is a response to the fact that you can't do it any other way. So if you acknowledge, just as a precondition, that you're not going to be able to get your application to run on one process on one box, um, it's going to have to get split into countless little pieces. Uh, that actually, that reality, which is a reality that we exist in, because um, Moore's Law slowed down at some point or whatever, that reality has forced us into an environment where things are, you know, completely decoupled and fragmented. Uh, if you do that naively, you'll be in a world of pain. And so I think the reason why things like CNCF need to exist is that if you walk into this without um, being educated about the way to do it properly, you'll end up uh, you know, like swimming up upstream you know, potentially for years. <laughs> and reinventing and, and, a lot of mistakes. Yeah, things like yeah. Uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus and Fluentd and other things in the, in the CNCF are all like, built for that world and make it sane. Um, and that is the world that we live in, for better or worse. <laughs> yeah. Very true. Good. So, uh, Chris, you mentioned uh, Cloud Native Foundation. You mentioned CNCF. What is the Cloud Native Foundation? Uh, so, you know, I'll step back and talk a little bit about history of kind of how things got started. So, uh, some people, you know, are probably familiar, familiar with Kubernetes, right? So, Google open sourced Kubernetes uh, and approached. Uh, the Linux Foundation, uh, which hosts a bunch of different other foundations. I know it's confusing. confusing. It's not just Linux. There's the Node.js Foundation. They do Let's Encrypt. So they came to the LF uh, and basically were like, hey, we open source Kubernetes. We want to build a foundation around it. But we just don't want it to be purely around Kubernetes, right? There's a whole suite of technology that essentially makes up cloud native, that Kubernetes is just one piece. Uh, you know, essentially, if you think of Kubernetes just focusing on orchestration and management, there's a whole slew of like technology around monitoring, trace, you know, tracing, how you actually define and build out your microservices that kind of need to live under um, you know, this, this uh, essential foundation. So um, you know, Google kind of seeded the thing with Kubernetes, uh, and we formed basically uh, a foundation with initial set of members that really cared about this problem. So uh, Google came, came on board, Cisco, uh, IBM, Huawei, uh, you know, Docker, uh, WeWorks, a bunch of companies kind of that were kind of pioneering um, you know, technology in the space to kind of build out a neutral ground where we kind of collaborate and start filling in the kind of missing pieces of the cloud native stack because some of the technology is not fully uh, developed yet or is not fully integrated yet. So uh, we just provide an avenue for uh, companies and projects to uh, collaborate under uh, a neutral and friendly uh, banner. So it's the Kubernetes Foundation? Yeah, it's not, yeah. and it's not the Google Foundation either. So there's more projects that are uh, not influenced <laughs> uh, by Google. So. And we're only about a year old, so we're very young for uh, a foundation. So if you look at other open source foundations out there, like Apache, OpenStack, you know, they're, you know, they've been around for quite a while. We're literally just over uh, a year old. So, so Jonathan, you, you've been a member of the foundation since its inception. Um, what's, like, what is it about, like, why do you think the CNCF was created, and is it, is it accomplishing what it said it was going to accomplish? Uh, yeah, as sort of Chris sort of touched on, um, obviously Kubernetes has you know, dominated the early conversations around CNCF since that was kind of the seed project. Um, but as you mentioned, Google was very, uh, you know, wanted to be very careful and make sure that it was a broader foundation. And so, you know, from the very beginning, we were um, you know, interested in, in from, from the very beginning, just trying to find out what other projects would make sense. Um, when we were also cognizant that, uh, you know, we didn't have a prescription of what exactly the, the foundation would um, mean sort of technically and what projects would be inside from the beginning and um, we wanted that to kind of emerge as we were considering projects and based on the decisions that we made about what projects we thought would be a good fit then we'd sort of start to see um, things like practices and more of a kind of a higher level ideas about what the foundation is to sort of emerge from that. Great. And Luke from, from Weaveworks standpoint have you guys sort of have you experienced what you're hoping to experience with the CNCF and if not what more should the CNCF provide? Yeah, so I, I think for us, the, um, uh, the CNCF has been a, a great way to sort of be in the middle of it. 
uh, be in the middle of all of the new emerging technology and um, and and be able to sort of have an impact there. Um, I think that as a brand, um, I think the CNCF uh, has a great opportunity to um, to actually sort of crystallize a bunch of best practices in real working software that can be picked up off the shelf and uh, where the software doesn't have hard dependencies, but they work very well together. So like, I think a, a great example of that is um, how Prometheus works so well with Kubernetes. There's, there's lots of um, uh, similarities in terms of the way it uses labels and selectors and, and how the pull model of Prometheus fits really well into the world of Kubernetes. And so you don't have to use one or the other with each other, um, but they work really well together. And, and so I think, um, I, I think that, that, that 2017 will be a great year for, um, for the CNCF and, and the projects in it. Great. So, um, so Ben, from an um, open tracing project standpoint, what's the project experience been like within the CNCF, being, getting involved, the, um, the good and the bad of the, of the whole process for incubation and some of the other inception projects, all the different projects that we've defined? I mean, it's been very positive for us, for sure. I mean, um, open tracing, just for people who aren't familiar with it, is, uh, is essentially a way of describing the behavior of complicated distributed systems, in, uh, typically in a cloud-native environment. And uh, it's, it's really crucial for open tracing to succeed as a standard, because it really is a standards project, um, for it to be uh, nestled between uh, other important, well-respected projects. And I think uh, CNCF's um, taste, so to speak, in terms of other projects has been like very good. The technical committee, Jonathan being among them, um, is like world class, absolutely top tier people. And they're, uh, to see how they scrutinize projects and to listen into the calls which are public, where you can see the way that they, um, the, the way that they kind of measure and evaluate other technology, um, it, uh, it kind of warms my heart. It's like they're asking the right <laughs> questions, they're thinking about things in the right way. So in as much as from a branding standpoint, it's helpful for open tracing to be in that company, it's been awesome. Um, and in terms of um, technical, technical marketing assistance and those sorts of more practical things, it's also been very helpful. Um, but yeah, it, it's actually, it's been, it's been great. Um, I have no complaints. Great. Which is a very boring answer. I wish I could say something no. really controversial. <laughs> no, uh, Ken was harassing me about how much cheaper it is to live in St. Louis. That was frustrating, but <laughs> I can't really say that's a, Saint, that's a CNCF <laughs> issue. So are there any questions in the audience yet? Not yet? Okay. Well, keep thinking, because I'll come back to you. And anybody can win a prize except is that, that guy. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to just kind of talk a little bit about some of the technologies. Um, so we, Kubernetes was the first project. There's been other projects added. Um, what are some of the gaps that you're seeing and, and what makes a cloud native solution and what's missing from the cloud native foundation so far? I mean, I, I, I have a couple thoughts on this. Like we've, we've taken some technologies in around, uh, you know, let's say monitoring, tracing, but we've kind of uh, ignored some of the spaces that are a little bit more, uh, let's, let's, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, innovative, more controversial. Uh, so things like storage is a bit of a, uh, you know, a mess in, in kind of the cloud native container uh, focused world. Uh, networking um, is a bit of a political, um, you know, environment. There's different approaches or two main really approaches to kind of networking. Um, so we've kind of avoided uh, some of those areas of kind of bringing projects in. And I think in 2017, um, you know, there's already been discussions throughout, the, hey, maybe it's time to revisit networking. It's changed quite a bit, uh, you know, uh, since last year. And uh, there's uh, quite a lot of different uh, folks interested in storage and coalescing kind of around a container storage interface or some kind of, you know, standard way to interface with all the different uh, kind of storage providers uh, out there. So you'll definitely see a uh, focus on those two. Um, th those just come to my, my mind right now because those are the discussions we've been ha having actively with uh, CNCF community members. Um, any other folks have opinions on uh, what's, what's missing, missing pieces? For me, those are definitely the priorities. I think net networking is kind of the most conspicuous one because, uh, you know, it's, 
one of the goals of the, the sort of CNTF and the cloud native movement is to, is to provide uh, cross-platform abstraction. So it's not locked into any one vendor. So for example, uh, the way that AWS does networking or Google does networking, um, we want to have tools that we can use to uh, provide consistent networking, whether it's in your data center or, or in AWS, for example. Um, so I'd really love to see uh, CNCF doing more there, because there's a lot, of, a lot of projects out there already working on this stuff, including some from Cisco. Yeah, we are at a networking event. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we might be able to help with that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to add in to what's missing? I mean, I, I would... Uh, I, I would argue that like most of the things that you actually build applications out of storage networking come yeah. to mind um, uh, are like presently absent from the sort of like CNCF portfolio. I mean, I think there's that landscape slide that yeah, describes yeah. sort of various areas of investment from a technology standpoint. Um, some of them seem like they're less important uh, to get right early on. So like maybe I mean, if, as an investment, there are things you can swap out as as a as someone who's assembling an application, but um, but yeah, I, I am concerned about uh, about uh, companies getting like locked into an AWS ecosystem uh, or something like that. In as much as uh, CNCF can protect companies from from that fate, I think that could be a, a incredibly valuable. So when when country. you think about um, you know storage and networking, what sort of the the CNCF way of of addressing that this year? Like how how do we sort of how do we as a community kind of start building some projects and getting projects contributed around networking and storage? I, uh, I defer to the TOC on, <laughs> on that matter. Like, I didn't, we, did, we didn't uh, talk like structure in terms of how CNCF is, 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 is kind of governed. Is, uh, there's essentially like a typical governing board as a board of directors. They handle the business stuff, which you know, I'm uh, part of as part of staff. We help facilitate that. There's kind of like a... We call it the TOC, but it's kind of a technical Supreme Court. They, they make all the technical decisions. They decide which projects go in, uh, which, which, which don't make the cut, the overall technical uh, vision. So there's kind of this separation of, of, of church and state, I guess, is one way to kind of look at it. We, we as staff can't force the foundation to take any particular project, which kind of makes the job somewhat frustrating. I can't just you know, willy-nilly write executive orders and just like jam them in and you know, add projects to the CNCF. There has to be a separate branch that deals with that. Uh, that problem. So um, yeah, I don't know. I think the TOC should kind of speak to this uh, to this problem. <laughs> sure. I mean, we have had projects in these spaces kind of proposed to the TOC before, um, but as Chris kind of hinted at, it's been a little bit controversial. Um, but one initiative that we uh, that we've just decided on, I think last week when we had a CNCF uh, TOC meeting, uh, was to create these sort of working groups. Um, so I think one of the first working groups that's going to be spun up is around storage. Um, so that's going to you know involve. Uh, sort of surveying, you know, surveying the current state of the world, looking at some different projects out there, um, and then trying to come up with a path forward for maybe a, potentially a project that could be that, that we should reconsider for the TOC um, to be added to the CNCF, or maybe we decide that you know it's not quite time. Right. I think the work groups are going to help a lot with the sort of making it inclusive for everyone. We're not trying yeah. to pick king. We're not trying to be kingmakers and say. We only select this one technology, so I think that's a key point. Good. Um, when, you, when you think about networking, what's what is CNI and what is like lib networking, and like how do we start to kind of bring those things together? You think, Luke? Uh, sure. <laughs> so, um, so CNI is the container network interface or container networking interface, um, and it's it's a pretty simple API that allows uh, a provider of a network. Um, to be plugged into Kubernetes and other um, uh, orchestrators that support CNI. Um, and uh, I, you may wish to correct me if I, if I misspeak here, but I, I think the basic idea is like, when, you, when you spin up a container or a pod, for example, you, the, you can ask the CNI network to uh, give you an IP address for that pod, um, and then that IP address gets uh, attached. Um, and the obligation of the provider of the CNI interface is um, allow me to route traffic around um, between those IP addresses. Um, so, so that's what it is. Um, it's, I mean, people say that infrastructure should be boring, um, and it kind of is in a, in a sense. Um, but, uh, but I think the CNI was an interesting example of, like, it wasn't a prescriptive um, uh, sort of spec. Um, 
it, it, it left quite a lot open to the implementer. Um, whereas I've heard criticisms of lib storage. You mentioned lib storage. Um, lib storage, no, not lib, lib storage, net, sorry, lib network. Lib network. Yeah. Lib network. Um, Lib Network from Docker uh, is much more opinionated about the about what what needs to exist in the world. So the, the Docker model of networking um, is that a, network, a Docker network is a, a security group or an isolated or an isolation group, um, and the way that you have uh, uh, containers that are on different networks able to communicate with each other is that you join a container to multiple networks, and so that's just a completely different model to the CNI model. Um, and, it's, and it's more opinionated. And um, I think that uh, Lib Network has seen less adoption as a result uh, by vendors um, uh, be because of that. I think that's a fair assessment. Yeah, yep. definitely. You might want to add, add to that. In terms of, um, like when you think about cloud native definitions and doing design with cloud native, how is that different from just designing for Amazon or, or Google? Cloud, for that matter. I can take that, or do yeah. you want to have a go? I go for it. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so th this is what I think is kind of interesting about the the phrasing of cloud native computing foundation. Because if I came to it and I, and I didn't know anything about it, I might just think that oh, that's a way of like encouraging people to design for cloud specific APIs and build their apps so that they can run in the cloud or a cloud. Um, and so if you take AWS as an example, because it's the biggest cloud, then um, it would be easy to, to say, OK, well, you should just build your app so that it runs on AWS. You should build or use all the AWS tools. Um, but that's not what the Cloud Native Computing Foundation is about. The Cloud Native Computing Foundation is about openness and portability, I think. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so it's actually about building a, a set of tools that can run on top of any cloud infrastructure um, that can allow you freedom in where you run your application. And so we see Kubernetes as a building block. We see things like WeaveNet, which you can run anywhere, like another building block of that, um, because you really can run it on Raspberry Pis in your data center or in your house. Um, or you can run it on top of like VMware or, um, uh, or Cisco equipment yeah. or, or uh, EC2. Sure, so, yeah. yeah. I see it as a risk, minimiza risk minimization thing. I mean, fundamentally, Amazon's uh, fiduciary responsibility to their investors and, and shareholders is to extract revenue, right? And it's like, yeah. that's not the same thing as the goals of someone who's trying to deploy their application. I mean, uh, the, the, the trouble with, with getting moved into a cloud native environment, which again, I don't think is something that we really have a choice about. I think that the requirements, the business requirements and the technology requirements have collided to force you to split your application to small pieces in order to run at maximum efficiency. And when you move into that world, especially given how much confusion there is uh, in the technology industry just perpetually, because things change so quickly, it's very, very easy to paint yourself into a corner, like extremely easy. And a lot of those corners have like vendors who will happily sell you like massive support contracts or send you massive bills for these services that you're tightly coupled to. And, uh, and I mean, in as much as there are um, uh, organizations, CNCF being one of several, I think, that are capable of helping to provide a map to this landscape that will prevent you from getting backed into a corner. Like the, the difference between, to get back to the original question of just building on Amazon, you can just build on Amazon and end up inadvertently two years down the line being like completely locked into something that's uh, like very expensive and not like very fun to use. And, and I, I think that's a situation that every buyer should be like really wary of. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I think that there are an, a number of people in the ecosystem that recognize that making, uh, making customers like truly successful and happy is going to like generate a larger market for everyone. And, and I mean, that's, that's what it's about. It's, I mean, it is ultimately uh, about just about making it easier for customers making a digital transformation to do that sanely. Um, and, and I don't think that just like increasing your spend on a cloud provider is actually getting that accomplished. Yeah, and I think there's an aspect of developer efficiency. And you said like it's not very fun. Right. And I, I think there's an aspect of uh, containers and, and Docker exploded because it made shipping software more fun than it was before. Um, it, it made uh, it possible for developers to iterate more quickly and have more reliable results. Um, 
And, and so there's an aspect of, uh, sort of, I think, some of the CNCF projects sort of crossing different stages of the software development lifecycle as well as being all about running in production sort of on a cloud provider or elsewhere. I might just touch on the open source side of things then, because you know, if you're building against a, purely against the AWS platform, for example, um, and one of, the, you know, one of the systems that you're using is lacking a feature or has some kind of bug, you know, you're a little bit powerless in terms of how much you can do. If you're a, maybe if you're a sort of big customer, you might have a little bit more influence, but you know, how many people are in sort of the top tier of AWS customers, whereas with cloud-native stuff that's open source, you can jump in there and maybe fix it yourself or sort of push to add this feature yourself. Um, or you know, potentially pay, pay some contractors through it if you don't have the technical expertise yourself. It's just you have a lot more kind of possibilities when you start to hit these limits or these bugs or have, need these new features in, your, in the system that you're building. Yeah, you could show up in a Kubernetes SIG and shout at people until exactly. it gets fixed. Yeah. Yeah. Or fix it yourself. Yeah. So how important is open source in a foundation like the CNCF? Uh, <laughs> Sounds like one I mean, it wouldn't be pot like... The foundation would not exist, essentially. It's all about essentially providing a open, neutral level playing field for everyone. And so you need to have some respect of open source license associated with the code uh, in the foundation that sets the rules of engagement, essentially. So for CNCF, we default to uh, the Apache 2.0 license, which basically, um, it's a liberal license. It basically means you could do really whatever you want with the code. You're not, there's no there's no force clause of you having to be forced to contribute back, but generally it's in your best interest to contribute back because if you fork something or do something like, you want to make sure you're as close as upstream as possible. So generally the incentive is for you to uh, contribute back out of just your own um, self-interest. So, uh, you know, we decided to standardize on that. It's, it's common in many other open source foundations, OpenStax on Apache to um, a lot of other different folks uh, generally like it. It's a very friendly, liberal, uh, business-friendly um, license. So, in, uh, Ben, in terms of observability, what's the difference in cloud native with being able to kind of understand what's happening with all these different systems versus just traditional yeah. monitoring that we're used to yeah. and, and we're familiar with? Yeah, I mean, most traditional monitoring was designed to um, make sure that the, v the, that the bare metal machine that you were running on didn't, like, explode. I mean, that was the point. And since the bare metal machine, like, you know, has been abstracted away, uh, there, that, uh, that entire tool chain of, of you know, single, machine mo of single machine logging, single machine um, you know, system health metrics, that sort of stuff is either irrelevant or certainly insufficient in a proper cloud native environment where the application has been exploded into thousands of independent moving parts. Um, I mean, I think the purpose of observability tools and monitoring tools is to tell stories about systems. Like, that's always been the point since the 1960s when, you know, the first monitoring tools were developed. It's always been about telling clear stories. And process level monitoring and, and, and VM level monitoring even really is completely insufficient in that regard. Like, you can't tell a clear story at all from those tools. And so I think what you've seen is that um, in a cloud native environment, um, metrics monitoring at the very least, and actually I, I think in addition to that, not in opposition to, but in addition to that, complementing that, some form of tr cross-process tracing is like absolute table stakes. I don't know of a single company that's actually moved microservices and hasn't pursued tracing in some capacity, um, in addition to like high quality, high dimensional metrics monitoring. And they're doing that not because um, they're looking for ways to spend their valuable dev resources. They're looking for ways to actually like create some sort of sanity in a production environment where um, you're only able to reproduce errors in situ, in production. Like you can't reproduce things in development. So I think the tool chain has moved to be production only. Like that's the only environment that matters. And it's, I was chatting with someone before this about, uh, about trying to generate errors in a, in a dev environment. It's very difficult to do that these days. So, so monitoring these days means in production. It means distributed. And it, um, and it means cross-process. And so um, that, that set of requirements has broken most traditional monitoring tools. And I think CNCF has done very well by, by bringing, uh, you know, Prometheus, Fluentd, and Open Tracing into the fold. I think um, those are three technologies that, that really help um, ease some of the pain in that area. So. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I, so if I could just draw from that and, and sort of use an example to illustrate it, I mean, you might want to ask the question, like, what's the latency on my user service? Right. Um, but your user service is actually a microservice that's been deployed by your container orchestration framework across who knows where. Um, 
in a dynamically changing environment. And uh, it could be being updated multiple times a day or multi multiple times an hour. Each time it gets updated, it could get scheduled onto different machines. So, and you've missed the worst part of it, I think, which is that your user service is actually slow because it depends on another service, which yes. depends on another yeah. service, yeah. which depends on the service that was having a multi-tenant like, <laughs> overload. I mean, that's actually the problem. But one of my customers for my company, not Open Tracing, recently had an incident where they had SVP of engineering in the room with three groups that all had a concurrent error. And they emphatically denied that they had a shared dependency, even though the error showed up in all two services at exactly <laughs> the same time. And they actually had to go into their monitoring tools to literally educate these three teams, none of whom realized that they depended on this other service, which was some yellow pages lookup service that was like some backwater that happened to be on the critical path for all three services. And literally none of the three teams even realized that until their monitoring tools told them that story. And like, that is totally, like, that is just an example, but I assure you is like commonplace when you get into this yeah. fully deployed environment where you literally don't understand your own dependencies anymore. Yeah. And, and that's like the world that we live in. So you, yeah. your tooling needs to be intelligent enough to know that intrinsically, I think. Yeah. I can't even remember what the original question was now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's OK. Are there any questions from the audience? Come on, throw us some tough ones. Don't be shy. <laughs> I, got, I got one. Sure. So with the related to monitoring, I think you, you hit on a big piece. There's so much to a modern application today that makes it so hard to go into it. What's the most difficult part of application monitoring? Is it, is it API dependencies? Is it data access? Is it network? Is it services? Like, what is the hardest thing to get to the bottom of when there's a problem? That's a great question. Uh, I, I mean, in, so you mean in terms of root causes or in terms of instrumentation or both or what? But what, what's the hardest to get visibility at? That's really what I was at. Like, what is the hardest thing to see? Yeah, I mean, I think in a proper microservice architecture, the thing that's that's the, the, in the pyramid of need, you know, in terms of where the most pain is, it's usually that inter-service dependencies are not obvious and they're not self-evident unless you've instrumented your system to expose that. I think that's the area of, of like greatest need. Once you've exposed that, I think uh, the, the second most important problem is um, understanding um, the root cause of, of uh, of contention in distributed systems. Usually there's some choke point in some, whether it's a database or some under-provisioned service, understanding where that choke point is, and then further understanding where the load is coming from that's affecting that piece uh, is, is I, I think, the greatest uh, single source of, of abnormal behavior in distributed systems. Since I still have the mic, I have a follow-up question which is not related at all to the first question, but what's the most common mistake that you see people make when they move from a traditional application structure into a modern cloud-native microservice, pick your word, environment? Lack of standardization. Period. I mean, people, it, we have companies. Just the S word. Oh, we, no. have, we have companies that we work with where they have <laughs> literally two microservices per developer at their company. They have 300 developers, 600 services. And they've chosen, for whatever reason, in some ad hoc way, to have like 16 different ways of communicating between processes. It's an absolute nightmare for them. Nightmare. It's a world of pain. You're I don't not even talking about Cisco, are you? I'm not uh, talking about Cisco. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> but I, I think that like, that is the biggest mistake, is that you make the wise choice of and of, of betting on microservices and allowing your dev teams total flexibility, that's OK. But like, they shouldn't have total flexibility. Like, they should have to agree on some basic table stakes of how they build their applications. Because you don't have standardization at that type of inter-process layer, orchestration layer, it's almost impossible to, to accomplish anything without multiplying it by the number of teams you have from a cost standpoint. And that's just like death. you know. So that's the biggest mistake I see. I don't know how you guys feel about it. But. So Jonathan, from QoS's standpoint, you've, you've helped a lot of companies in this transition from monolithic to cloud native architectures. So what are some of the pain points you guys have experienced? Uh, it's a tough question. Um, I think it kind of has been touched on not having, um, you know, if you don't actually agree on these standards for how the organization, what the organization is going to use to, to um, you know, put apps to communicate and things like that, then you just, Moving to microservices just completely multiplies all the problems that you, you know, might have once had. Um, so it's definitely kind of a, a net negative. Um, I think that, yeah, you really need to, um, 
I think a company like uh, you know Google, which is kind of one of the pioneers of this, a lot of this sort of cloud, what we're calling cloud native now, um, you know, made a really a strong choice kind of early on when they were developing their platform to, to mandate that all developers would use it and sort of access it in the same way, and they would all agree on the same RPC framework, the same packaging mechanism, and so forth. And that 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 really allowed them to unlock all the benefits that this moving to this really dynamic, whoops, sorry, model <laughs> allows. Um, and we have, yeah, I mean, we do see organizations really struggling with that because. Maybe developers want to use their pet technologies or whatever they, you know, they, they, the cool latest microservice buzzword technology is. Um, maybe they want to still retain some of the old tech that they were using um, to deploy the app the previous world. Um, so I definitely think that's actually pretty much it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's so it's really interesting because I think there are sort of two um, aspects to that standardization, if I'm allowed to use the S word. Um, the, the, that we've identified so far. So the first one is like, which RPC format do you use? Like, how do things communicate? But then the other one, which is particularly interesting for me, is like, which, um, uh, how do you deploy those services? Do you use the same orchestration framework, or does every team get to pick its own deployment and then operate its own deployment in its own snowflake way? I heard of one company that shall remain nameless, where every team uh, had their own AWS account, and they were free to use their own AWS account in whichever way they liked and whichever tools they wanted to deploy to it. Um, and what happened after like, they got two years into this project of trying to do microservices this way, and they discovered that their um, inter-account AWS transfer bills were through the roof. <laughs> um, and, so they, and, and to be fair to them, this was before like, uh, the, uh, the now popular orchestration frameworks really came about, um, that, that they had this sort of initial approach. And they're now refactoring everything to run on like one big Kubernetes cluster, which is multi-tenant at the container level rather than at the infrastructure level. Um, and that seems to be the way that people are going. Good. Any other questions from the audience? Yeah. Oh, we have a question over here. Yeah, I was talking to the uh, Cisco on Cisco people uh, down the hall there, and they uh, recommended this uh, tetration server where you roll in this rack of uh, servers and put agents on all of the uh, hosts, and then it's, it'll give you a map um, you know, of all your dependencies and, and things like that. I just wonder, do you, do you think that's a, 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 a good approach or a starting uh, approach is to instrument the servers with um, agents to uh, get uh, mapping of these dependencies? I think, I think for the most part, um, it depends on what you're trying to monitor. And so in, in the case of like cloud native, we're trying to get to the microservices, that wouldn't be the best approach. But in the case of titration, where you're looking at network flows and network traffic, um, that is a good approach because all of that data flows through the sensors. And that's where they're collecting the data about the network that then they can make analytics about the network and what's happening with the applications running across your network. So a lot of the microservices wouldn't be going through those sensors. They would be kind of like into process communications happening within a server. So uh, Tritration has a different model that, that leverages Kubernetes for that, that type of monitoring. So, so again, it depends on what you're trying to monitor. and it, when you talk about storage, like storage has its own set of like monitoring that you have to worry about. When you look at security and event, security and event monitoring solutions, that's a completely different set of monitoring that you're trying to figure out a different part of your infrastructure. So unfortunately, you have to have different monitors for different things. And that's just the way, the way it is so far. Hopefully one day we'll have microservices for, it, for everything and not have to worry about it. But it's not, we're not quite there yet as an industry. We're very early, I think very early days of microservices, so. And if you wouldn't excuse, a, if you would excuse a small plug, um, I'll just mention the open source project from Weaveworks called Weavescope, um, which has a small agent you can put on all your machines. Uh, you can deploy it as a Kubernetes daemon set, for example, um, and it'll just show you what's there and show you the connections between them. And that's kind of a useful way of sort of just having a very basic level, even before you go into this uh, more sophisticated um, sort of open tracing world or Prometheus. Um, it's just a, a simple way of seeing, well, what have you got and what's talking to what? Great. Any other questions from the audience? These are great questions. Oh, OK. 
Uh, so I, I was just given the little five-minute warning. So the last question um, that I had was for you to each talk about what you see happening this year in the CNCF. What's sort of the, like, what, what do we consider success this year? What are the big, the big things that we want to get done? Uh, you know, I'll speak uh, to this from, like, a foundation point of view. Um, like we mentioned earlier, there's a few project areas that we're kind of focusing on. I definitely expect uh, us getting a couple, you know, maybe one or two storage-related projects, uh, maybe a consolidation of some of the networking uh, projects within CNCF. I think we'll definitely see that uh, happen in, in, uh, in 2017. Um, you know, just like a little uh, kind of pre-announcement, um, you know, we are going to be uh, accepting um, a project from Google next week called gRPC, which essentially is kind of a microservice definition uh, you know, you can think of it as a Microsoft definition framework, but a little more fancier than that. But um, that'll really be our first technology within CNCF that kind of focuses on more of the microservice definition piece, which kind of has been um, uh, kind of a missing piece from, from CNCF. So the whole, like, how you define your microservices, your app definition, that's kind of been like a big missing glaring hole for CNCF. gRPC kind of helps uh, fill, fill some of that. Um, those are those like you know things that come to my mind. Um, you know we're uh, you know as a foundation we're we're definitely growing in terms of community. So uh, we probably will have ten plus projects for the year ends. Um, our conferences have been tripling in growth since last year, so it's been quite amazing just to see uh, a lot of companies and people get involved um, uh, in, in this space. And uh, when's the next conference, Chris? Next conference will be in Berlin, in uh, you know lovely Berlin, in about a month. So March 29th and 30th uh, at the BCC. Uh, in Berlin. So if you're interested in um, cloud native technology or Kubernetes, Prometheus, and the associated set of technologies, uh, please, please register and attend. Um, it will most likely sell out over the next couple of weeks. Um, so uh, please do that. So looking forward for over the next year from the, from the, sort of from the perspective of the technical committee of the, of the CNCF, um, there's a couple of things we'd like to see. I think one is that uh, so far we've been very focused on just sort of uh, you know, evaluating projects and accepting them. And we haven't necessarily spent much time working with projects um, and seeing how we on the TOC can support them better. So that's kind of one, one area that I'd like to, like to see some more action in. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we have this new idea of working groups where the TOC is a bit more active in sort of evaluating different areas that we do need to address and where we might want to encourage uh, projects to apply. Since so far we've been a little bit more passive in terms of um, you know, letting project, lots of projects have come to us, which is been great, um, but I think we should also start to think a bit more strategically about um, areas that we want to kind of make sure that we don't have any gaps. Um, and then a final area is one thing we haven't talked about is that CNCF provides a, um, Intel has provided a cluster yeah. of about a thousand bare metal nodes um, for use by, by the community. Um, and we'd like to see more active use of that. We need to, need to do a little bit of work there in, in sort of how, how we can expose that to users in the community, but to allow them to do things like CI testing or you know, distributed system testing um, on this cluster, uh, both with CNCF um, projects, you know, the projects that are already in the organization, and maybe related projects to see how we can, um, yeah, help them get the best use of the cluster. Great, cool. Um, so from my perspective, I'm going to take this one from the perspective of the users, um, because I, I spend a lot of time in, in my work uh, talking with users and, and, and helping users. And I think one thing that we need to get better at as a community is teaching. Um, I think that it's very easy to talk about uh, all of these big complicated ideas, but being able to just say, like, this is everything you need to know about Kubernetes on one slide, and then, like, this is everything you need to know about Prometheus in maybe 10 slides. And so that's something that I, I'm actively working on, and uh, we've just launched the Weave Online User Group. So if you want to go on meetup.com and check it out, you can come to our talks, and we will try and teach you about these things. And that's something we should talk about, actually, yeah, absolutely. Uh, doing more, more broadly in the community, because yeah. I think it, it'll, it'll lift everyone up yeah. if, if we can make it easier to understand these concepts which actually aren't that difficult, um, but which I think we need to do a better job of documenting and communicating. Absolutely. Yeah, and the third leg of the CNCF is, is the user community, which we're, we're building out quickly. Yeah, so absolutely. They're kind of like the judicial branch. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so, so, Ben, from a project standpoint, what are some of the things you'd like to see the CNCF accomplish this year? Well, I mean, I, I've certainly talked to a lot of customers that are moving in the, uh, in the direction of 
of CNCF's yeah. sphere at an incredibly rapid clip. I mean, 2017 is the year when a lot of them are planning on shutting off some of their um, legacy approaches to like building applications. And I, I mean, uh, as as a member of, of the CNCF, it's exciting uh, to to see that reality play out at like an incredibly rapid clip. Um, uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, with the, the growth of, of the portfolio of projects that are in CNCF and, uh, and the attention given to it at conferences and so on and so forth, um, that, uh, that you know, everything associated with it, I'm, uh, so far we've benefited um, quite a bit and I'm sure we will um, in the future as, as organizations uh, attempt to you know, demangle this like, incredibly confusing signal they're getting from the technology landscape, I think CNCF has a very strong and sensible opinion and, and I'm looking forward to people taking their advice, frankly, so yeah. Great. Well, I'd like to thank you guys for attending today. Um, right after this panel, there's a panel on how DevNet uh, kind of cloudified their platform, leveraging a lot of the same principles, and you can kind of hear more about that if you want to hang out. Uh, tomorrow there's a session on how you create applications in a cloud-native way that will go in some of the details of the, the, different, pat the different aspects of a cloud-native application. Um, and these guys will hopefully be around in um, D6 for a little while today if you want to ask them any questions. I encourage you to go up and you know, having, having this great of an audience, great group of uh, uh, panelists up here is, is an honor and great to have here. So let's give them a hand and thank them for, uh, for coming out. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all Kevin. very much. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.